Chapter 58 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. Chapter 58 The Home as a School of Good Manners. Not long ago I visited a home where such exceptionally good breeding prevailed, and such fine manners were practiced by all the members of the family that it made a great impression upon me. This home is the most remarkable school of good manners, refinement, and culture generally I have ever been in. The parents are bringing up their children to practice their best manners on all occasions. They do not know what company manners mean. The boys have been taught to treat their sisters with as much deference as though they were stranger guests. The politeness, courtesy, and consideration which the members of this family show toward one another are most refreshing and beautiful. Coarseness, gruffness, lack of delicacy, find no place there. Both boys and girls have been trained from infancy to make themselves interesting, and to entertain, and try to make others happy. The entire family make it a rule to dress before dinner in the evening just as they would if special company were expected. Their table manners are specially marked. At table, everyone is supposed to be at his best, not to bring any grouch, or a long or sad face to it, but to contribute his best thought, his wittiest sayings, to the conversation. Every member of the family is expected to do his best to make the meal a really happy occasion. There is a sort of rivalry to see who can be the most entertaining, or contribute the spiciest bits of conversation. There is no indication of dyspepsia in this family, because everyone is trained to laugh and be happy generally, and laughter is a fatal enemy of indigestion. The etiquette of the table is also strictly observed. Every member of the family tries to do just the proper thing and always to be mindful of others' rights. Kindness seems to be practiced for the joy of it, not for the sake of creating a good impression on friends or acquaintances. There is in this home an air of peculiar refinement, which is very charming. The children are early taught to greet callers and guests cordially, heartily, in real southern hospitable fashion and to make them feel that they are very welcome. They are taught to make everyone feel comfortable and at home, so that there will be no sense of restraint. As a result of this training, the children have formed a habit of good behavior, and are considered an acquisition to any gathering. They are not embarrassed by the awkward slips and breaks, which are so mortifying to those who only wear their company manners on special occasions. A stranger would almost think this home was a school of good breeding, and it is a real treat to visit these people. It is true, the parents in this family have the advantage of generations of fine breeding and southern hospitality back of them, which gives the children a great natural advantage. There is an atmosphere of chivalry and cordiality in this household which is really refreshing. Many parents seem to expect that their children will pick up their good manners outside of the home, in school, or while visiting. This is a fatal mistake. Every home should be a school of good manners and good breeding. The children should be taught that there is nothing more important than the development of an interesting personality, an attractive presence, and an ability to entertain with grace and ease. They should be taught that the great object of life is to develop a superior personality, a noble manhood and womanhood. There is no art like that of a beautiful behavior, a fine manner, no wealth greater than that of a pleasing personality. End of chapter 58 The Home as a school of good manners. Chapter 59 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. Chapter 59 Mother. 
All that I am or hope to be, said Lincoln, after he had become president, I owe to my angel mother. My mother was the making of me, said Thomas Edison, recently. She was so true, so sure of me, and I felt that I had someone to live for, someone who I must not disappoint. All that I have ever accomplished in life, declared Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist, I owe to my mother. To the man who has had a good mother, all women are sacred for her sake, said John Paul Richter. The testimony of great men in acknowledgment of the boundless debt they owe to their mothers would make a record stretching from the dawn of history to today. Few men, indeed, become great who do not owe their greatness to a mother's love and inspiration. How often we hear people in every walk of life say, I never could have done this thing but for my mother. She believed in me, encouraged me, when others saw nothing in me. A kiss from my mother made me a painter, said Benjamin West. A distinguished man of today says, I never could have reached my present position had I not known that my mother expected me to reach it. From a child she made me feel that this was the position she expected me to fill, and her faith spurred me on and gave me the power to attain it. Everything that a man has and is, he owes to his mother. From her he gets health, brain, encouragement, moral character, and all his chances of success. In the shadow of every great man's fame walks his mother said Dorothy Dix. She has paid the price of his success. She went down into the valley of the shadow to give him life, and every day for years and years thereafter she toiled incessantly to push him on toward his goal. She gave the labor of her hands for his support. She poured into him ambition when he grew discouraged. She supplemented his weakness with her strength. She filled him with her hope and faith when his own failed. At last he did the big thing, and people praised him, and acclaimed him, and nobody thought of the quiet, insignificant little woman in the background, who had been the real power behind the throne. Sometimes even the king himself forgets who was the king-maker. Many a man is enjoying a fame which is really due to a self-effacing, sacrificing mother. People hurrah for the governor, or mayor, or congressman, but the real secret of his success is often tucked away in that little unknown, unappreciated, unheralded mother. His education and his chance to rise may have been due to her sacrifices. It is a strange fact that our mothers, the molders of the world, should get so little credit and should be so seldom mentioned among the world's achievers. The world sees only the successful son. The mother is but a round in the ladder upon which he has climbed. Her name or face is seldom seen in the papers. Only her son is lauded and held up to our admiration. Yet it was that sweet, pathetic figure in the background that made his success possible. The woman who merits the greatest fame is the woman who gives a brilliant mind to the world. The mothers of great men and women deserve just as much honor as the great men and women themselves, and they will receive it from the better understanding of the coming days. A wife may do much towards polishing up a man and boosting him up the ladder, but unless his mother first gave him the intellect to scintillate and the muscles to climb with, the wife labors in vain, continues Dorothy Dix in the evening journal. You cannot make a clod shine. You cannot make a mollusk aspire. You must have the material to work with to produce results. 
By the time a man is married, his character is formed, and he changes very little. His mother has made him, and no matter how hard she tries, there is very little that his wife can do toward altering him. It is not the philosophies, the theories, the code of ethics that a man acquires in his older years that really influence him. It is the things that he learned at his mother's knee, the principles that she instilled in him, in his very cradle, the taste and habits that she formed, the strength and courage that she breathed into him. It is the childish impressions that count. It is the memory of whispered prayers, of bedtime stories, of old ideals held unfalteringly before a boy's gaze. It is half-forgotten songs and dim visions of heroes that a mother taught her child to worship, that make the very warp and woof of the soul. It is the pennies that a mother teaches a boy to save, and the self-denial that she inculcates in doing it, that form the real foundation of the fortune of the millionaire. It is the mother that loves books, and who gives her sons her love of learning, who bestows the great scholars the writers and orators on the world. It is the mother that worships science, who turns the eyes of the child upon her breast, up to the wonder of the stars, and who teaches the little toddler at her side to observe the marvel of beast and bird and flower and all created things, whose sons become the great astronomers and naturalists and biologists. The very atmosphere that radiates from and surrounds the mother is the inspiration and constitutes the holy of holies of family life. In my mother's presence, said a prominent man, I became for the time transformed into another person. How many of us have felt the truth of this statement? How ashamed we feel when we meet her eyes, that we have ever harbored an unholy thought or dishonorable suggestion. It seems impossible to do wrong while under that magic influence. What revengeful plans, what thoughts of hatred and jealousy have been scattered to the four winds while in the mother's presence. Her children go out from communion, with her resolved to be better men, nobler women, truer citizens. How many of us have stood and watched with admiration the returning victor of some petty battle, cheering until we were hoarse, exhausting ourselves with the vehemence of our enthusiasm, says a writer, when right beside us, possibly touching our hand, was one greater than he, one whose battle has not been petty, whose conflict has not been of short duration, but has, for us, fought many a severe fight, when we had the scarlet fever or diphtheria, and no one would come near us? Who held the cup of cold water to our fever-parched lips? Who bent over us day and night, and fought away with almost supernatural strength, the greatest of all enemies, death, the world's greatest heroine, mother? Who is it that each Sunday, dinner-time, chose the neck of the chicken, that we might have the juicy wing, or breast, or leg? Who is it that stays home from the concert, the social, the play, that we may go with the others and not be stinted for small change? Who is it that crucifies her love of pretty clothes, her desire for good things, her longing for pleasure, that we may have all these? Who is it? mother. The greatest heroine in the world is the mother. No one else makes such sacrifices, or endures anything like the suffering that she uncomplainingly endures for her children. What is the giving of one's life in battle, or in a wreck at sea, to save mother, in comparison with the perpetual sacrifice of many mothers, of a living death, lasting for half a century or more. How the world's heroes dwindle in comparison with the mother heroine. 
there is no one in the average family the value of whose services begins to compare with those of the mother, and yet there is no one who is more generally neglected or taken advantage of. She must remain at home evenings, and look after the children, when the others are out having a good time. Her cares never cease. She is responsible for the housework, for the preparation of meals. She has the children's clothes to make or mend. There is company to be entertained, darning to be done, and a score of little duties, which must often be attended to at odd moments, snatched from her busy days. And she is often up working at night, long after everyone else in the house is asleep. No matter how loving or thoughtful the father may be, the heavier burdens, the greater anxieties, the weightier responsibilities of the home, of the children, usually fall on the mother. Indeed, the very virtues of the good mother are a constant temptation to the other members of the family, especially the selfish ones, to take advantage of her. They seem to take it for granted that they can put all their burdens on the patient, uncomplaining mother, that she will always do anything to help out, and to enable the children to have a good time, and in many homes, sad to say, the mother just because of her goodness, is shamefully imposed upon and neglected. Oh, mother won't mind. Mother will stay at home. How often we hear remarks like this from thoughtless children. It is always the poor mother on whom the burden falls, and the pathetic thing is that she rarely gets much credit or praise. Many mothers in the poor and working classes practically sacrifice all that most people hold dearest in life for their children. They deliberately impair their health, wear themselves out, make all sorts of sacrifices, to send a worthless boy to college. They take in washing, go out house-cleaning, do the hardest and most menial work, in order to give their boys and girls an education and the benefit of priceless opportunities that they never had. Yet, how often, they are rewarded only with total indifference and neglect. Some time ago I heard of a young girl, beautiful, gay, full of spirit and vigor, who married and had four children. Her husband died penniless, and the mother made the most heroic efforts to educate the children. By dint of unremitting toil and unheard-of sacrifices and privations, she succeeded in sending the boys to college and the girls to a boarding school. When they came home, pretty, refined girls and strong young men, abreast with all the new ideas and tastes of their times, she was a worn-out, commonplace old woman. They had their own pursuits and companions. She lingered unappreciated among them for two or three years, and then died of some sudden failure of the brain. The shock of her fatal illness woke them to consciousness of the truth. They hung over her as she lay prostrate in an agony of grief. The oldest son, as he held her in his arms, cried, You have been a good mother to us. Her face brightened. Her eyes kindled into a smile, and she whispered, You never said so before, John. Then the light died out, and she was gone. Many men spend more money on expensive caskets, flowers, and emblems of mourning than they ever spent on their poor, loving, self-sacrificing mothers for many years while alive. Men who, perhaps, never thought of carrying flowers to their mothers in life, pile them high on their coffins. Who can ever depict the tragedies that have been enacted in the hearts of American mothers who have suffered untold tortures from neglect, indifference, and lack of appreciation? What a pathetic story of neglect many a mother's letters from her grown-up children could tell. A few scraggy lines, a few sentences now and then, hurriedly written and mailed, often to ease a troubled conscience, mere apologies for letters, 
which chilled the mother heart. I know men who owe their success in life to their mother, who have become prosperous and influential because of the splendid training of the self-sacrificing mother, and whose education was secured at an inestimable cost to her, and yet they seldom think of carrying to her flowers, confectionery, or little delicacies, or of taking her to a place of amusement, or of giving her a vacation, or bestowing upon her any of the little attentions and favors so dear to a woman's heart. They seem to think she is past the age for these things, that she no longer cares for them, that about all she expects is enough to eat and drink, and the simplest kind of raiment. These men do not know the feminine heart which never changes in these respects, except to grow more appreciative of the little attentions, the little considerations, and thoughtful acts which meant so much to them in their younger days. Not long ago I heard a mother, whose sufferings and sacrifices for her children during a long and trying struggle with poverty, should have given her a monument, say, that she guessed she'd better go to an old lady's home and end her days there. What a picture that was! An aged woman, with white hair and a sweet, beautiful face, with a wonderful light in her eye, calm, serene, and patient, yet dignified, whose children, all of whom are married and successful, made her feel as if she were a burden. They live in luxurious homes, but have never offered to provide a home for the poor, old, rheumatic mother, who for so many years slaved for them. They put their own homes, stocks, and other property in their wives' names, and while they pay the rent of their mother's meagerly furnished rooms, and provide for her actual needs, they apparently never think what joy it would give her to own her own home, and to possess some pretty furnishings, and a few pictures. In many cases, men through thoughtlessness do not provide generously for their mothers, even when well able to. They seem to think that a mother can live most anywhere, and most anyway, that if she has enough to supply her necessities, she is satisfied. Just think, you prosperous businessmen, how you would feel if the conditions were reversed, if you were obliged to take the dependent, humiliating position of your mother. Whatever else you are obliged to neglect, take no chances of giving your mother pain by neglecting her and of thus making yourself miserable in the future. The time may come when you will stand by her bedside, in her last sickness, or by her coffin, and wish that you had exchanged little of your money for more visits, and more attentions, and more little presents to your mother, when you will wish that you had cultivated her more, even at the cost of making a little less money. There is no one else in this world who can take your mother's place in your life, and there is no remorse like that which comes from the remembrance of ill-treating, abusing, or being unkind to one's mother. These things stand out with awful vividness and terrible clearness when the mother is gone forever from sight, and you have time to contrast your treatment with her long-suffering tenderness and love, and her years of sacrifice for you. One of the most painful things I have ever witnessed was the anguish of a son who had become wealthy, and in his prosperity neglected the mother, whose sacrifices alone had made his success possible. He did not take the time to write to her more than twice a year, and then only brief letters. He was too busy to send a good long letter to the poor old lonely mother back in the country, who had risked her life, and toiled and sacrificed for years for him. Finally, when he was summoned to her bedside in the country, in her last sickness, and realized that his mother had been for years 
without the ordinary comforts of life. While he had been living in luxury, he broke down completely, and while he did everything possible to alleviate her suffering in the few last days that remained to her on earth, and gave her an imposing burial, what torture he must have suffered at this pitiful picture of his mother who had sacrificed everything for him. The regrets for thoughtless acts and indifference to admonitions now felt and expressed by many living sons of dead mothers will in time be felt and expressed by the living sons of living mothers, said Richard L. Metcalf in The Commoner. The boys of today who do not understand the value of the mother's companionship will yet sing with those who already know this song of tribute and regret. The hours I spent with thee, dear heart, are as a string of pearls to me. I count them over, every one apart, my rosary. Each hour a pearl, each pearl a prayer, to still a heart in absence wrung. I tell each bead unto the end, and there a cross is hung. O memories that bless and burn, O mighty gain and bitter loss! I kiss each bead, and strive at last to learn, To kiss the cross, sweetheart, to kiss the cross. No man worthy of the name ever neglects or forgets his mother. I have an acquaintance of very poor parentage, Who had a hard struggle to get a start in the world, But when he became prosperous, and built his beautiful home, he furnished a suite of rooms in it, especially for his mother, furnished them with all conveniences and comforts possible, and insisted upon keeping a maid specially for her. Although she lives with her son's family, she is made to feel that this part of the great home is her own, and that she is as independent as though she lived in her own house. Every son should be ambitious, to see his mother as well provided for as his wife. Really great men have always reverenced and cared tenderly for their mothers. President McKinley provided in his will that, first of all, his mother should be made comfortable for life. The first act of Garfield, after he was inaugurated president, was to kiss his aged mother, who sat near him and who said this was the proudest and happiest moment of her life. Ex-President Loubet of France, even after his elevation to the presidency, took great pride in visiting his mother, who was a humble market gardener in a little French village. A writer on one occasion, describing a meeting between this mother and her son, says, Her noted son, awaited her in the marketplace, as she drove up in her little cart loaded with vegetables. Assisting his mother to alight, the French president gave her his arm, and escorted her to her accustomed seat. Then, holding over her a large umbrella to shield her from the threatening weather, he seated himself at her side, and mother and son enjoyed a long talk together. I once saw a splendid young college graduate introduce his poor, plainly dressed old mother to his classmates with as much pride and dignity as though she was a queen. Her form was bent, her hands were calloused, she was prematurely old, and much of this deterioration was caused by all sorts of drudgery to help her boy to pay his college expenses. I have seen other college men whose mothers had made similar sacrifices, and who were ashamed to have them attend their graduating exercises, ashamed to introduce them to their classmates. Think of the humiliation and suffering of the slave mother who has given all the best of her life to a large family, battling with poverty in her efforts to dignify her little home and to give her children education 
when she realizes that she is losing ground intellectually, yet has no time or strength for reading or self-culture, no opportunity for broadening her mental outlook by traveling or mingling with the world. But this is nothing compared to the anguish she endures when, after the flower of her youth is gone and there is nothing left of her but the ashes of a burnt-out existence, the shreds of a former superb womanhood, she awakes to the consciousness that her children are ashamed of her ignorance and desire to keep her in the background. From babyhood, children should be taught to look up to, not down on, their mother. For that reason, she should never appear before them in slovenly raiment, nor conduct herself in any way that would lessen their respect. She should keep up her intellectual culture, that they may not advance beyond her understanding and sympathies. No matter how callous or ungrateful a son may be, no matter how low he may sink in vice or crime, he is always sure of his mother's love, always sure of one who will follow him even to his grave, if she is alive and can get there, of one who will cling to him when all others have fled. It is forever true, as Kipling poignantly expresses it in his beautiful verses on Mother Love. If I were hanged on highest hill, Mother o' mine, O mother o' mine, I know whose love would follow still, Mother o' mine, O mother o' mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, Mother o' mine, O mother o' mine, I know whose tears would come down to me, Mother o' mine, O mother o' mine. If I were cursed of body and soul, Mother o' mine, O mother o' mine. I know whose prayers would make me whole. Mother o' mine, O oh, mother o' mine. One of the saddest sights I have ever seen was that of a poor, old, broken-down mother, whose life had been poured into her children, making a long journey to the penitentiary to visit her boys, who had been abandoned by everybody but herself. Poor old mother! It did not matter that he was a criminal, that he had disgraced his family, that everybody else had forsaken him, that he had been unkind to her. The mother's heart went out to him just the same. She did not see the hideous human wreck that crime had made. She saw only her darling boy, the child that God had given her, pure and innocent as in his childhood. Oh, there is no other human love like this, which follows the child from the cradle to the grave, never once abandons, never once forsakes him, no matter how unfortunate or degenerate he may become. So your best girl is dead, sneeringly said a New York magistrate to a young man who was arrested for attempting suicide. Who was she? Without raising his eyes, the unfortunate victim burst into tears and replied, She was my mother. The smile vanished from the magistrate's face, and with tears in his eyes, he said, Young man, go and try to be a good man, for your mother's sake. How little we realize what tragedy may be going on in the hearts of those who we sneeringly condemn. What movement set on foot in recent years deserves heartier support than that for the establishment of a National Mother's Day? The day set apart as Mother's Day by those who have inaugurated this movement is the second Sunday in May. Let us unite in doing all we can to make it a real Mother's Day by especially honoring our mothers in the flesh, those of us who are so fortunate as to have their mothers with us, in the spirit, those who are not so fortunate. If away from her, write a good loving letter, or telephone, or telegraph, to the best mother who ever lived, your mother, 
Send her some flowers, an appropriate present. Go and spend the day with her, or in some other way make her heart glad. Show her that you appreciate her, and that you give her credit for a large part of your success. Let us do all we can to make up for past neglect of the little known, half appreciated, unheralded mothers who have had so little credit in the past, and are so seldom mentioned among the world's achievers, by openly, and especially in our hearts, paying our own mothers every tribute of honor, respect, devotion, and gratitude that love and a sense of duty can suggest. Let us acknowledge to the world the great debt we owe them by wearing, every one of us, boy and girl, man and woman, on Mother's Day, a white carnation, the flower chosen as the symbol and emblem of motherhood. Happily chosen emblem, what could more fittingly represent motherhood, with its whiteness, symbolizing purity, its lasting qualities, faithfulness, its fragrance, love, its wide field of growth, charity, its form, beauty. What an impressive and beautiful tribute to motherhood it would be for a whole nation to unite one day in wearing its chosen emblem, and in song and speech and other appropriate exercises, to honor its mothers. End of chapter 59 Mother Chapter 60 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin Chapter 60 Why So Many Married Women Deteriorate A woman writes me, You would laugh if you knew the time I have had in getting the dollar, which I enclose for your inspiring magazine. I would get a pound less of butter, a bar less of soap. I never have a cent of my own. Do you think it wrong of me to deceive my husband in this way? I either have to do this or give up trying at all. There are thousands of women who work harder than their husbands and really have more right to the money, who are obliged to practice all sorts of deceit in order to get enough to buy clothing and other things essential to decent living. The difficulty of extracting money from an unwilling husband has been the beginning of thousands of tragedies. The majority of husbands are inclined to exert a censorship over their wives' expenditures. I have heard women say that they would go without necessary articles of clothing and other requirements, just as long as possible and worry for days and weeks before they could summon courage to ask for money, because they dreaded a scene and the consequent discord in the home. Many women make it the rule never to ask for money, except when the husband is leaving the house and in a hurry to get away. The disagreeable scene is thus cut as short as possible, as he has not time then to go into all the details of his wife's alleged extravagancies, and find out what has become of every cent of the money given her on some similar previous occasion. The average man does not begin to realize how it humiliates his wife to feel that she must ask him for fifty cents, a dollar, or five dollars, every time she needs it, and to tell him just exactly what she is going to do with it, and then perhaps be met with a sharp reproof for her extravagance of foolish expenditures. Men who are extremely kind and considerate with their wives in most things are often contemptibly mean regarding money matters. Many a man who is generous with his tips and buys expensive cigars and orders costly lunches for himself and friends at the club because he wants to be considered a good fellow will go home at night and bicker with his wife over the smallest expenditure, destroying the whole peace of the household, when perhaps she does not spend as much upon herself as he does for cigars and drink. Why is it that men are so afraid to trust their wives with money, when they trust them explicitly with everything else, especially as women are usually much more economical than men would be 
in managing the home and providing for the children. A large part of the friction in the average home centers around money matters and could be avoided by a simple, definite understanding between husband and wife and a business arrangement of household finances. A regular advance to the wife for the household and a certain sum for personal use, which she does not need account for, would do more to bring about peace and harmony in the majority of homes than almost anything else. To be a slave to the home, as many women are, and then to be obliged to assume the attitude of a beggar for every little bit of money she needs for herself, or to have to give an accounting for every cent she spends, and tell her lord and master what she did with her last money before she can get any more, is positively degrading. When the husband gets ready to regard his wife as an equal partner in the marriage firm, instead of as an employee with one share in a million-dollar company, or as merely a housekeeper, when he is willing to regard his income as much as his wife's, as his own, and not put her in the position of a beggar for every penny she gets, when he will grant her the same privileges he demands for himself, when he is willing to allow his wife to live her own life in her own way, without trying to boss her, we shall have more true marriages, happier homes, a higher civilization. Someone says that a man is never so happy as when he has a few dollars his wife knows nothing about. And there is a great deal of truth in it. Men who are perfectly honest with their wives about most things are often secretive about money matters. They hoodwink them regarding their incomes, and especially about any ready cash they have on hand. No matter how much the average man may think of his wife, or how considerate he may be in other matters, he rarely considers that she has the same right to his cash that he has, although he may be boasting to outsiders of her superior management in matters of economy. He feels that he is the natural guardian of the money, as he makes it, that he has a little more right to it than has his wife, and that he must protect it and dole it out to her. What disagreeable experiences, unfortunate bickerings, misunderstandings and family prejudice could be avoided if newly married women would insist upon having a certain proportion of the income set aside for the maintenance of the home and for their own personal needs, without the censorship of their husbands and without being obliged to give an itemized account of their expenditures. It is a rare thing to find a man who does not waste ten times as much money on foolish things as does his wife, and yet he would make ten times the talk about his wife's one-tenth foolishness as his own ten-tenths. On the other hand, thousands of women, starving for affection, protest against their husband's efforts to substitute money for it, to satisfy their cravings, their heart hunger, with the things that money can buy. It is an insult to womanhood to try to satisfy her nature with material things, while the affections are famishing for genuine sympathy and love, for social life, for contact with the great, throbbing world outside. Women do admire beautiful things, but there is something they admire infinitely more. Luxuries do not come first in any real woman's desires. She prefers poverty with love to luxury with an indifferent or loveless husband. How gladly would these women whose affections are blighted by cold and indifference or the unfaithfulness of their husbands exchange their liberal allowance, their luxuries, for genuine sympathy and affection. One of the most pathetic spectacles in American life is that of the faded, outgrown wife, standing helpless in the shadow of her husband's prosperity and power having sacrificed her youth, beauty, and ambition, nearly everything that the feminine mind holds dear, to enable an indifferent, selfish, brutish husband to get a start in the world. 
does not matter that in her unselfish effort to help him she burned up much of her attractiveness over the cooking stove, that she lost more of it at the wash tub in scrubbing and cleaning and rearing and caring for their children during the slavery of her early married life. It does not matter how much she suffered during those terrible years of poverty and privation. Just as soon as the selfish husband begins to get prosperous, finds that he is succeeding, feels his power, he often begins to be ashamed of the woman who has given up everything to make his success possible. It is a sad thing to see any human being whose life is blighted by the lack of love. But it is doubly pathetic to see a woman who has given everything to the man she loved and who gets in return only her board and clothes and an allowance, great or small. Some men seem to think that the precept, man does not live by bread alone, was not meant to include woman. They cannot understand why she should not be happy and contented if she has a comfortable home and plenty to eat and wear. They would be surprised to learn that many a wife would gladly give up luxuries and live on bread and water if she could only have her husband's sympathy in her aspirations, his help and encouragement in the unfolding of her stifled talents. I know a very able, promising young man who says that if he had had a rich father, he never would have developed his creative power, that his ambition would have been strangled, that it was the desperate struggle to make a place for himself in the world that developed the real man in him. This young man married a poor girl who had managed by the hardest kind of work and sacrifice to pay her way through college. She had just begun to develop her power, to feel her wings, when her husband caged her in his home, took away her highest incentive for self-development. He said that a man who could not support a wife without her working had no business to marry. He dressed his wife like a queen, gave her horses and carriages and servants, but all the time he was discouraging her from developing her self-reliance taking away all motives for cultivating her resourcefulness and originality. At first the wife was very eager to work. Her ambition rebelled against the gilded chains by which she was bound. She was restless, nervous, and longed to use her powers to do something for herself and the world. But her husband did not believe in a woman doing the things she wished to do. He wanted his wife to look pretty and fresh when he returned from his business at night, to keep young and to shine in society. He was proud of her beauty and vivacity. He thought he loved her, but it was a selfish love, for real love has a tender regard for a person's highest good, for that person's sake. Gradually the glamour of society, the leith of a luxurious life, paralyzed her ambition, which clamored less and less peremptorily for recognition, until at length she subsided into a life of almost total inaction. Multitudes of women in this country today are vegetating in luxurious homes, listless, ambitionless, living narrow, superficial, rutty lives, because the spur of necessity has been taken away from them, because their husbands, who do not want them to work, have taken them out of an ambition-arousing environment. But a life of leisure is not the only way of paralyzing the development of a wife's individuality. It can be done just as effectively by her becoming a slave of her family. I believe that the average wife is confined to her home a great deal too much. Many women do not seem to have any existence outside of the little home orbit do not have any special interests or pleasures to speak of apart from their husbands. They have been brought up to think that wives have very little purpose in life other than to be the slaves and playthings of their lords and masters, to bear and bring up children, and to keep meekly in the background. The wife who wishes to hold her husband's affection, if he is ambitious, must continue to grow, must keep pace with him mentally, 
she must make a continual investment in self-improvement and in intellectual charm, so that her mental growth will compensate for the gradual loss of physical charm. She must keep her husband's admiration, and if he is a progressive man, he is not likely to admire a wife who stands still mentally. Admiration is a very important part of love. You may be very sure that if you have an ambitious husband, you must do something to keep up with him besides lounging, idling about the home, reading silly novels, dressing stylishly, and waiting for him to return at night. If he sees that your sun rises and sets in him, that you have little interest outside, that you are not broadening and deepening your life in other ways by extending your interests, reaching out for self-enlargement, self-improvement, he will be disappointed in you, and this will be a great strain upon his love. It is impossible for a girl who has had only a little schooling to appreciate the transforming power that comes from liberal education and broad culture. For the sake of her husband and children, and her own peace of mind and satisfaction, she should try to improve herself in every possible way. Think of what it means to be able to surround one's home with an atmosphere of refinement, culture, and superior intelligence. The quality of one's own ideals has a great deal to do with the quality of the ideals of one's family. If considered alone from the standpoint of self-protection, as a safeguard, a woman ought to get a liberal education, a college education, if possible. The conditions of home life in this country are such that it is very difficult for the wife to keep up with her husband's growth, to keep pace with him because he is constantly in an ambition-arousing, stimulating environment. Unless she is unusually ambitious and has great power of application and concentration and plenty of leisure, she is likely to drop behind her husband. As a rule, the husband has infinitely more to encourage and stimulate him than has the wife. Success itself is a tremendous tonic. The consciousness of perpetual triumph, of conquering things, is a great stimulus. It is true that women have developed more admirable and loving qualities in their home life than have men, but during all these centuries, while women have been shut up in the home, men have been touching hands with the great busy world, absorbing knowledge of human nature and broadening their minds by coming into contact with men and things. They have developed independence, stamina, strength, by being compelled to solve the larger, more practical problems of life. The business man and the professional man are really in a perpetual school, a great practical university. The strenuous life, however dangerous, is essentially educative. The man has the incalculable advantage of a great variety of experiences and of freshness of view. He is continually coming in contact with new people, new things, being moulded by a vast number of forces in the busy world which never touch the wife. If women, equally with men, do not continue to grow and expand after marriage, how can we expect race improvement? Woman must ascend to higher, wider planes or both man and woman must descend. Male and female created he, them. There is no separating them. They must rise or fall together. The woman's cause is man's. They rise or sink together, dwarfed or godlike, bond or free. Many a man has tired of his wife, because she has not kept pace with him, because, instead of growing broader and keener as the years pass, she has become narrow. It never occurs to him that the fault may be wholly his own. In the early years of their married life, he perhaps laughed at her dreams, as he called her longings for self-improvement. He discouraged, if he did not actually oppose, 
every effort she made to grow to the full stature of her womanhood. His indifference or hostility quenched the hopes she had indulged before marriage. The bitterness of her disappointment crushed her spirit. She lost her buoyancy and enthusiasm, and gradually sank to the level of a household drudge. And the husband wonders what has changed the joyous, high-spirited girl he married into the dull, apathetic woman who now performs her duties like an automaton. There are today thousands of wives doing the work of ordinary housemaids, who, putting it on a low standard, are smothering ability to earn perhaps more money than the man who enslaved them. If they only had an opportunity to unfold the powers which God has given them, but they have been brought up from infancy to believe that marriage is the only real career for a woman, that these longings and hungerings for self-expression are to be smothered, covered up by the larger duties of a wife and mother. If the husband could change places with their wives for a year, they would feel the contracting, narrowing influence in which the average wife lives. Their minds would soon cease to reach out. They would quickly feel the pinching, paralyzing effect of the monotonous existence, of doing the same things every day, year in and year out. The wives, on the other hand, would soon begin to broaden out. Their lives would become richer, fuller, more complete, from contact with the world, from the constant stretching of their minds over large problems. I have heard men say that remaining in the home on Sundays or holidays just about uses them up, that it is infinitely harder and more trying than the same time spent in their occupations, and that while they love their children, their incessant demands, the noise and confusion, would drive them to drink if they had to bear it all the time. Strong men admit that they cannot stand these little nerve-wracking vexations of the home, yet they wonder why the wife and mother is nervous, and seem to think that she can bear this sort of thing 365 days in the year, without going away and getting relief for a half dozen days during the whole time. Few men would exchange places with their wives. Their hours are shorter, and when their day's work is done, it is done, while a wife and mother not only works all day, but is also likely to be called during the night. If anyone is disturbed in the night by the children, it is the mother, rarely the father. How long would men continue to conduct their business offices or factories with the primitive senseless methods in vogue in the average kitchen today? Man puts all his inventiveness, his ingenuity, in improving methods, in facilitating his business, and getting the drudgery out of his work in his office and factory. But the wife and mother still plods along in an ill-fitted kitchen and laundry, and yet our greatest modern inventor has said that the cares of the home could be reduced to a minimum, and the servant problem solved if the perfectly practicable devices for lightening household labor were adopted in the home. But, many of our men readers will say, is there any profession in the world grander than that of home making? Can anything be more stimulating, more elevating than home making and the rearing of children? How can such a vocation be narrowing or monotonous? Of course it is grand. There is nothing grander in the universe than the work of a true wife, a noble mother. But it would require the constitution of a Hercules, an infinitely greater patience than that of a Job, to endure such work with almost no change or outside variety, year in and year out, as many wives and mothers do, without breaking down. The average man does not appreciate how almost devoid of incentives to broad-mindedness, to many-sidedness, to liberal growth, the home life of many women is. There is a disease called arrested development, in which the stature of the adult remains that of a child, all physical growth and expansion having stopped. 
one of the most pitiable phases of American life, and one of the most discouraging elements in our civilization, is the suppressed wife who is struggling with arrested development after marriage. I have known of beautiful young wives who went to their husbands with the same assurance of confidence and trust as to their hopes and ambitions with which a child would approach its mother, only to meet with a brutal rebuff for even venturing to have an ambition which did not directly enhance the husband's comfort or convenience in his home. It is a strange fact that most men think that when a woman marries, she goes to her new home with as rigid vows as the monks take on entering the monastery, or the nuns the convent, and they regard the suggestion of a career for her, which does not directly bear upon the home, as domestic treason. There are some women, especially sensitive ones, who would never again tell their husbands of their hopes and aspirations, after they had been laughed at and ridiculed a few times, but would be forever silent, even when the canker of bitter disappointment was consuming them. Suppose a girl has the brains and the ability of a George Eliot, and she marries a young businessman, who thinks that writing articles or books, or devoting a large part of her time to music, is all nonsense that her place is at home, taking care of it, and bringing up her children, and denies her the right to exercise her talent. How would he like to have the conditions reversed? It is true that woman is peculiarly fitted for the home, and every normal woman should have a home of her own, but her career should not be confined or limited to it any more than a man's. I do not see why she should not be allowed to live the life normal to her, why she should be denied the right of self-expression any more than the man, and I regard that man as a tyrant who tries to cramp her in the natural expression of her ambition, or sneers at, nags, and criticizes her for seeking to bring out, to unfold, the sacred thing which the Creator has given her. This is one of her inalienable rights, which no man should dare interfere with. If he does, he deserves the unhappiness which is likely to come to his home. A wife should neither be a drudge nor a dressed-up doll. She should develop herself by self-effort, just as her husband develops himself. She should not put herself in a position where her inventiveness, resourcefulness, and individuality will be paralyzed by lack of motive. We hear a great deal about the disinclination of college girls to marry. If this is a fact, it is largely due to the unfairness of men. The more education girls get, the more they will hesitate to enter a condition of slavery, even under the beautiful guise of home. Is it any wonder that so many girls refuse to marry? refuse to take chances of suppressing the best thing in them? Is it any wonder that they protest against putting themselves in a position where they will not be able to deliver to the world the sacred message which the Creator has given them? I believe in marriage, but I do not believe in that marriage which paralyzes self-development, strangles ambition, discourages evolution and self-growth and which takes away the life purpose. To be continually haunted by the ghosts of strangled talents and smothered faculties prevents real contentment and happiness. Many a home has been made miserable, not because the husband was not kind and affectionate, not because there was not enough to eat and to wear, but because the wife was haunted with unrealized hopes and disappointed ambitions and expectations. Is there anything more pitiful than such a stifled life with its crushed hopes? Is there anything sadder than to go through life conscious of talents and powers which we cannot possibly develop, to feel that the best thing in us must be strangled for the want of opportunity, for the lack of appreciation, even by those who love us best? To know that we can never, by any possibility, 
reach our highest expression, but must live a sordid life when under different conditions a higher would be possible. A large part of the marital infelicity about which we hear so much comes from the husband's attempt to cramp his wife's ambition and to suppress her normal expression, a perversion of native instinct, a constant stifling of ambition, and the longing to express oneself naturally, gradually undermine the character and lead to discontentment and unhappiness. A mother who is cramped and repressed transmits the seeds of discontent and one-sided tendencies to her children. The happiest marriages are those in which the right of husband and wife to develop broadly and naturally along individual lines has been recognized by each. The noblest and most helpful wives and mothers are those who develop their powers to their fullest capacity. Woman is made to admire power, and she likes to put herself under the domination of a masterful man and rest in his protection. But it must be a voluntary obedience which comes from admiration of original force, of sturdy, rugged, masculine qualities. The average man cannot get away from the idea of his wife's service to him personally, that she is a sort of running mate, not supposed to win the race, but to help to pull him along so that he will win it. He cannot understand why she should have an ambition which bears no direct relation to his comfort, his well-being, his getting on in the world. The very suggestion of woman's inferiority, that she must stand in the man's shadow and not get ahead of him, that she does not have quite the same rights in anything that he has, the same property rights, the same suffrage rights, in other words, the whole suggestion of woman's inferiority has been a criminal wrong to her. Many women who are advocating woman's suffrage perhaps would not use the ballot if they had it. Their fight is one for freedom to do as they please, to live their own lives in their own way. The greatest argument in the woman's suffrage movement is woman's protest against unfair, unjust treatment by men. Man's opposition to woman's suffrage is merely a relic of the old-time domestic barbarism. It is but another expression of his determination to boss everybody and everything about him. The time will come when men will be ashamed that they ever opposed woman's suffrage. Think of a man considering it right and just for his most ignorant workmen to have an equal vote with himself on public matters, and yet denying the right to his educated wife and daughters. End of chapter 60 Why so many married women deteriorate